Joe Calzaghe had a fascinating boxing career. He's one of those fighters who turned out to be incredibly polarizing. Whenever you ask any hardcore boxing fan about him, you will always get a different response. Some people think that he was an all-time great and one of the best fighters ever to come out of the UK. Others think that he was a complete and utter fraud and a cherry picker who had a padded record and avoided threats. Either way, he was a fighter that definitely divided opinions more so than most. Nordic Warrior here, hope you guys are all doing well. Today I felt like doing another retrospective boxing video. I do these occasionally from time to time where I assess the careers of certain fighters from the past and basically hypothesize and speculate how they would have done against certain opponents they never fought, how they would do in today's era and basically how good were they really. Today I'm going to be looking at Joe Calzaghe. So, recently I've been watching a whole bunch of Calzaghe's old fights as well as a few DVDs and documentaries of his that I own and I've really been looking into and scrutinizing his resume, his strengths and weaknesses and what fights of his stand out to me the most. Now, one of the criticisms you will often hear about Calzaghe and why many boxing fans don't view him as an all-time great is because many of the standout wins on Calzaghe's resume came against fighters who were past their prime, namely Roy Jones Jr. and Bernard Hopkins. They were Joe's last two fights and what most boxing fans actually remember Joe for. However, for me personally, as a boxing fan who grew up in the UK during Joe's super middleweight title reign, those are not really the fights that stand out to me and they're not really the fights I remember most. I was born in 1994, so during my childhood and my teenage years, here in the UK, it was generally understood that Joe Calzaghe was the man. He was without a shadow of a doubt the best British fighter at the time, and maybe even the best European fighter at the time and of my generation. Here in the UK, even though Ricky Hatton was maybe the more popular and the bigger ticket seller, Joe Calzaghe was definitely regarded as the better fighter and the way that his career panned out by comparison, that certainly does um, appear to be the case. So my point is that there's a lot of nostalgia for me when I think of Calzaghe, and looking back at his career in retrospect, to me it's just fascinating. Joe became champion in 1997, beating a faded Chris Eubank for the vacant title. Now when I did my Steve Collins retrospective video a while back, you guys might recall that I talked about what a shame it was that we never got to see Joe Calzaghe versus Steve Collins when it was meant to happen. Now, for those of you who don't know, Joe was set to fight Steve Collins for the WBO title. However, Collins pulled out of the fight and Chris Eubank ended up stepping in on two weeks notice. Uh, it's a shame because in my personal opinion, Steve Collins would have been a much more difficult opponent for Joe uh, and certainly that version of Joe. And it certainly would have told us a lot more about him as a fighter. Collins was much closer to his prime than Eubank was, despite being about two years older than Eubank, and prior to the fight, had comfortably beaten Chris Eubank twice. Therefore, I think if Joe had faced Steve Collins at that point in time for the title, it would have been a much more interesting title challenge, and it definitely, in my opinion, would have told us a lot more about Joe. Collins' experience, durability, uh, along with Joe's lack of experience, and having only been the distance once, would have made it a really entertaining and interesting fight. Don't get me wrong, I would have favoured Joe for the win, but I just think that the timing of it would have made it a very intriguing fight and the very durable and very experienced Steve Collins would have been a very tough ask for Joe at that stage of his career. So he beat Chris Eubank pretty handily, dropping him in the first round and he pretty much outboxed and outworked him en route to a very wide unanimous decision victory. The win over Eubank got him the title and led to him going on to 12 years or so undefeated, uh, unifying the division and tying the record for consecutive title defences at 168. The record was previously held by Sven Otke, who was Joe's kind of unofficial rival. That's another fight that it's a shame never happened. It would have been a, a really good one in my personal opinion. Now Calzaghe's reign at 168. You know, it, it, it's really interesting to me because although he went on such a long unbeaten run. He didn't do so easily. In fact, throughout his reign, he had several fights that turned out to be much tougher than they looked on paper. This brings me to my main observation about Calzaghe, and one of the characteristics that he had 
he was one of those fighters, and I would I would put current heavyweight champion Tyson Fury in this same category. He's one of these fighters too. One of these fighters who would often fight to the level of his opposition. For example, when Kawasaki had a fight that was supposed to be 50-50 on paper, he usually won comfortably and convincingly. For example, Jeff Lacey, who was supposed to be one of Kawasaki's fiercest rivals, and a man that at the time was favoured to beat him, that fight turned out to be one of his easiest. He not only dominated the entire fight start to finish, but he beat Lacey at his own game, stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the man and gave him a serious beating. Likewise, when he fought Mikel Kessler, who was supposed to be one of his toughest fights, um, he comfortably and convincingly outboxed Mikel Kessler, and did so mostly at mid-range, just outboxing him behind a jab and winning from the outside. And he did so very convincingly, and he was a very versatile fighter who could fight different styles, and these supposedly tough and difficult opponents for him, he often made short work of. On the other hand, when it came to fighters who he was supposed to easily beat, these guys tended to be his toughest fights uh, and his hardest fights. For example, when looking over Kalzagi's career, one of the things you'll notice is that one of the hardest fights he had of his entire career was against a guy called Kabari Salem. Now, it's a really strange situation in retrospect because going into that fight, it was seen as a complete joke. Salem was supposed to be a walkover for Kawasaki, uh, an early KO against a hand-picked opponent. Salem going into that fight was coming off of a loss to Mario Veidt, a man who years earlier was KO'd in the first round by Kawasaki easily. Like, he went on to beat Salem, so that fight by any standard was almost a cherry pick gone wrong. Kawasaki got dropped, he got hurt multiple times, he got roughed up, he got taken the distance, and had a really, really tough night against Salem. And um, he admitted afterwards that it was actually one of the toughest fights of his whole career. Now, it's easy to say in retrospect that, oh, well, Kessler and Lacey were overrated and never that good anyway. But back then, when you look at the fights against the likes of Kabari Salem, where Kawasaki got dropped and hurt, it's very easy to see why people thought that a power puncher with good skills like Jeff Lacey was going to KO Kawasaki and expose him. Uh, some other examples of this uh, would be, for, like, for example, his fight against Robin Reed. That turned out to be one of Joe's tougher fights, uh, despite Robin Reed not really being as highly rated or being as highly regarded as the likes of Kessler and Lacey. You know, this is what I mean when I say things like Kawasaki fights to the level of his competition, just like Tyson Fury does when he gets dropped by the likes of Nevin Pajic and Steve Cunningham before going on to win the heavyweight world title. So yeah, Joe definitely had that same characteristic, and it's one of the things that makes his boxing career so fascinating in retrospect. As far as Joe's ability as a fighter goes, in my personal opinion, he was one of the best athletes I've ever seen in a boxing ring. Amazing stamina, amazing work rate, some of the best stamina and work rate I think I have ever seen. I'm talking prime Manny Pacquiao levels of stamina and work rate. And he's a super middleweight, making it all the more impressive when you think about it. He had some of the fastest hands I've ever seen from a super middleweight and put his combinations together beautifully. He did have some pretty major flaws though. For one, his punching technique was never the best. One of the major criticisms of his, even back then, was his tendency to slap rather than punch. He would often slap his opponents and throw lots of backhanders and wrist shots, which ultimately resulted in him breaking and damaging his hands on a regular basis. He was trained by his dad Enzo, who had very limited experience as a boxing trainer, so that might indicate why he never really learned how to throw a, pop a proper punch consistently in his fights. He was a very big puncher early in his career, however, by the time he became a unified champion, his hand injuries had taken away that big knockout left hand that he was known for earlier in his career. Uh, he had a tendency to rabbit punch too, and he would often get away with that in the UK. Um, yeah, he got away with that for years when he needed to. Um, when he needed to box, however, and, and use his jab and use his skills on the back foot and be slick, he could. Uh, like in the Kessler fight, for example, he showed he could box very effectively behind a jab, had some excellent balance, would double up and sometimes even triple up on the jab while on the move. 
in my opinion, he would have been a real handful for anybody of his size and weight, um, and, and anybody from that weight division throughout history, uh, just based on all those attributes he had. I mean, let's say, for example, he fought Bernard Hopkins when both guys were at their prime. I don't see how even a prime Bernard Hopkins would have dealt with the hand speed, the awkwardness, the flurries, and the volume of a prime Calzaghe. Uh, by the time they did fight, Bernard was 43, however, and, and, and he had aged much more slowly and had less wear and tear than Joe did. You know, Joe was in his mid-30s, so he was quite a bit younger than Hopkins. But despite that, um, you know, he had nowhere near the type of punching power or speed that he had in his prime years. So there's an argument to be made that Joe wasn't really at his prime and uh, had regressed even more than Hopkins had. And yet he was still able to outwork and outland Hopkins, who had a, a tricky counter-punching style and one as, one, was one of the most dirty and exploitative fighters in boxing history. Let's not forget, too, that years after losing the fight to Calzaghe, Hopkins went on to uh, win the light heavyweight title on several different occasions, beating the likes of Tavoris Cloud, Jean Pascal, uh, and Babert Shumanov for their belts. So, to me, there's an argument that could be made that Bernard Hopkins fighting Joe Calzaghe wasn't a shot fighter. Like, he may have been past his prime physically, but like I said, he aged a lot slower than most fighters, and even at 43, he was still dangerous. I mean, he even went on to go the distance with Sergei Kovalev years later, so that win that Calzaghe has over Hopkins looks much better in retrospect when you think about it. As for the Roy Jones win, Roy was definitely past his prime, there's no doubt about that. But, like I mentioned already, Joe wasn't exactly at his prime himself. He was only three years younger than Roy, he'd been dealing with injuries. He admitted himself that he was going through some issues in training, like for example, he was starting to cut corners and stuff like that. I mean, if you watch the documentary, and I'd recommend it, it's a really interesting one, the Joe Calzaghe documentary that I have on DVD here. Um, he actually talks about how going into the Roy Jones fight, he was he was cutting corners, his training didn't really go that well. And um, it was definitely going to be his last fight. Like, he had made up his mind that that was it. You know, it was just a, a cash-out fight for him. And yeah, you know, Roy Jones may not have been at his prime. He was definitely faded and regressed. Didn't have the stamina or the explosiveness that he had in his prime years. Um, it, th that would have been a fascinating fight, man. I would have loved to have seen Calzaghe versus Roy when they were both younger. You know, maybe if they'd have fought in, like... 2001, 2002, something like that, it would have been a fascinating fight. I would probably favor Roy, just based on him being just so much faster and, and so much more explosive, and, and even Calzaghe's work rate back then might not have been enough to get the better of Roy, but it would have been a, a fascinating fight. I, I definitely think it would have been more competitive than the fight ended up being. I mean, Joe Calzaghe pretty much, pretty much washed Roy Jones when they fought. He got dropped in the first round, but... From then on, it was all Joe. He just completely outworked and pummeled Roy. So yeah, the, the win against Roy Jones, you know, you can take it or leave it. Again, th those are not the fights that I really look at and view as Kawasaki's most memorable accomplishments. You know, th those were just cash-out fights, basically, you know, where he moved up to light heavyweight and took on a couple of old legends. Um, but, but the Hopkins one, like I mentioned earlier... In retrospect, that that fight really does look a lot better in retrospect because of what Bernard Hopkins went on to do afterwards. So, to me, Kawasaki was a really, really fascinating fighter, a really interesting one. He was a fighter who did things that you didn't normally see in that division. Um, I've never seen a super middleweight with the type of work rate and athleticism that Joe had. Obviously, Roy Jones had faster hands and was, was a lot quicker and more explosive, but even he didn't have the kind of work rate and stamina that Joe had in his prime. But he also had fantastic balance, he was so versatile, he could fight inside like he showed against Jeff Lacey, who was a very dangerous power puncher on the inside, or he could box outside against a more conventional guy like Kessler, who was tall and rangy and had a good jab and a good stiff right hand. You know, he could box with a guy like that and beat them using boxing fundamentals, so Kawasaki was a great fighter, he really was, he had flaws, okay, defensively he wasn't great, okay, he would get hit a lot in fights, but he had a fantastic chin, he had, and he had fantastic athleticism, which would get him out of trouble, so to me he was just a really good fighter, and 
it's really difficult to say how good he was because there were certain fights, like I mentioned, I would have loved to have seen the Oki fight, I would have loved to have seen the Steve Collins fight, I would have loved to have seen him fight a prime Roy Jones and a prime Bernard Hopkins, but we weren't able to see those fights and there's no point really complaining about it. Um, a lot of people at the time that Kawasaki decided to retire, they wanted to see him fight Chad Dawson, who you guys might recall was... Um, I, I believe he was a, an up-and-comer at light heavyweight when, when Joe fought Roy Jones and he was trying to get the Kawasaki fight. Uh, but obviously it never happened. Kawasaki had no interest in fighting Chad Dawson. and Chad Dawson, a few years later, turned out to be a hype job. He, he got completely exposed. So, I, I mean, maybe in retrospect, Joe should have fought him because he would have probably won that fight easily. But yeah, th there's a lot of fights that could have happened which didn't for whatever reason you know fights that didn't materialize but to me I think he was a really good fighter and in some ways he was very underrated because I don't see anybody right now in the super middleweight division um, you know just looking at today's super middleweight landscape I don't see any of those guys beating Kawasaki I mean <laughs> you think Canelo would beat Kawasaki really you think that Caleb Plant would beat Kawasaki. You think David Benavidez would beat Kawasaki? Come on, like those guys wouldn't be able to compete. So to me, he was probably the best super middleweight of all time. And um, that's not to say he would have beaten everybody. Again, I would probably favor a prime Roy Jones over him. You know, I'm, I'm just talking about compared to most fighters in that division, you know, and in, in, in comparing all their attributes. He had certain attributes that, I've, that I haven't seen since in that division. So, yeah, I think Kawasaki was a great fighter. I think the guy was, again, in many ways underrated. He wasn't perfect. He was flawed. He was definitely beatable. Um, he definitely had fights where he fought lesser competition and didn't look great, like against Kabari Salem and Robin Reed. There, you know, there were, there were several fights like that that Kawasaki had where he would just fight to the level of the opponent. But when he needed to step up, he really stepped up. Like those Jeff Lacey and Mikel Kessler fights, th th those fights I mentioned because those were the 50-50 fights. Those were the ones that a lot of people favored him to lose. And um, he won those fights very convincingly and really established himself as the man in his division. So yeah, I think Kawasaki was a great fighter. Um, how great he was, I don't really know. There's no real way to gauge it. So yeah, great fighter. Uh, that's my video. Let me know what you guys think. Let me know if you want to see more content like this. I'm planning to do videos like this, retrospective boxing videos for other fighters and other situations. Let me know what you guys think. Thanks for watching. God bless.